Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine, Pipeliner CRM. I'm going to be your host, and we have a, fan, a fantastic panel lined up who are going to tell you and guarantee giving you some ideas on how you can close more business before the end of the year, okay? Which is, let's face it, we're all in scramble mode right now. Either you want to make up the gap in your quota because you're not quite there, or maybe you're a little bit further away than that, or perhaps you've hit your quota and you're into those beautiful accelerators and you want to maximize them as, uh, as best you can. So first, I'd like to get the panel to introduce themselves. Uh, Chip Eichelberger, why don't you uh, take it away and tell everybody about you? Uh, Chip Eichelberger in Knoxville, Tennessee. What I do is uh, help make uh, boring conventions awesome. I open and close conventions. Uh, brand is about getting switched on and being your best consistently. Excellent. And Janice Mars, who is up in, in New York, who's crossing New York City today. How are you doing, Janice? I'm doing wonderful. Thank you very much, Sean. Um, and apologize for technology problems of not having my, my uh, video. But uh, uh, I represent Sales Latitude, and um, we're a, we help B2B companies conquer complex selling challenges. Um, we incorporate best practices, shifting sales teams' mindsets to the prospects' buying process. And what we do is we kind of ensure that both your near-term and long-term pipeline activity directly align with where your executives are spending their time, money, and resources. So I'm kind of excited about this because this is a topic that is near and dear to my heart. Excellent. And finally, Spencer Morona, who is up in Seattle, Washington. How are you doing, Spencer? Doing great, John. Thanks for having me on. Uh, so I'm the founder and owner of Performance North. It's a leadership development and sales consulting firm, and I help average salespeople become good and good salespeople become great. Uh, I think one thing that separates what I do is I use a um, scientifically validated objective measurable tool, uh, it's a 10-minute assessment that um, measures someone's how their thinking impacts their performance. So I help salespeople get out of their own way with their negative thinking and figure out how to make more money. Excellent. Uh, well, listen, thanks everybody for being with us. So we're going to get straight into this. And if you're an attendee, if you have a question, put it in the chat box and we'll, uh, we'll try to answer it. And again, uh, you know, this has been recorded, so this will be available later. So um, let's start off with um, the first question. Okay, so you know, some people would say, we're at the end of November now, we're heading into December. Yeah, you know, there's only really 20 business days left and, uh, you know, there's not really a lot I can do. And some people may be tempted to maybe give up, slow down or throw in the towel. Um, why, should, why should they resist that temptation? And why is the last month of the year still a great month to close business? Uh, maybe Chip, you want to take that one away? Well, I think a lot of it has to do with your mindset. Um, if you think that people are too busy to talk to you, they're going to be too busy to talk to you. So you have to come with some value for them. What's in it for them? You can't be going, what's in it for you? So how can you add value to them? Um, because reality of the situation is people are busy. People get more caught up in uh, family things and business things. But you've got to be able to pick your spots. What I think is you got to come with a real clear message, what you want to get across. I think uh, one of the strategies I've used for years is to call people early and call people late. You know, call people before eight o'clock. They're in there. They're busy. Call people after five, five o'clock getting past the decision maker. But you got to come with value and you've got to come with a unique offer. You know, when I was, I was with Tony Robbins for six years, everything around moving people to action revolves around pain and pleasure. You know, what's the cost of waiting, uh, of not going forward here before the end of the year? And then what's in it for them? How can you create something compelling? Because you got to come from what's in it for them, not what's in it for you. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Janice, what would you add to that? How, why would you encourage people not to give up? Well, I, I really liked what was just said, that it's not about you, um, that it's about kind of who you're selling to. Uh, that's kind of, kind of what sales latitude is all about. What I think is kind of interesting is, you know, people don't buy based on our quota year, right? Yeah. They're based upon their own timelines. Mm -hmm. And so in my world where, you know, we sell complex, large B2B systems, at this point in time, 20 days in, you should know the deals that you're going to win yeah. and the deals that you're not going to win. So from my perspective, because it's more of a B2B large complex, when you've got 20 days left, you should have been doing a lot of planning prior to that instead of waiting up until this point. Um, so that's kind of, kind of where I'm coming from, because if, if we are reflective of their time frame, we should have validated that way in advance. 
Yeah, great. Thanks, Janice. And how about you, Spencer? What would you say to people who are tempted to give up at this stage of the year? Yeah, I, I, I would echo what uh, both Chip and Janice said. They brought, brought up some great points, but <clears throat> I really also believe that, you know, it is about mindset. And I don't want to be redundant with what Chip said, but people come in right after Thanksgiving, they got the turkey hangover, and all of a sudden they, they think, oh, well, you know what, I'll, I'll get something done towards the end of the month. But the reality is, is if you have your ducks lined up, if you have your deals that, you know, this should be actually some of the best time to sell. These two weeks, I, I've always thought, uh, maybe not this week, but the first two weeks of December, if everyone was that busy, year around, we'd probably live like Europeans. We'd probably actually have more vacation time because it is time to get stuff done. And there's a million reasons to get in front of someone. But hey, you got to bring value. Chip is absolutely right. It's not about us. And we also don't want to just check it. No one likes to be checked in on, okay? You know, uh, my wife checks in on me. That's totally fine. Maybe if you're a kid sick, sick uh, home from school, you want to be checked in on. But if there is other opportunities, not only to to provide value to get in front of someone, but to drop off a gift. And I think we'll get into strategies a little bit later, but now is a critical time because the reality is if we come back after the first of the year, uh, that week people usually don't hit the ground running. It usually takes a week or two to get over the holiday hangover. Yeah, no, absolutely. These are all, all great points. And I think the, another one just to add is, um, it's great if there's a load of people out there who are giving up or are throwing in the towel for December because, hey, that yeah. just makes the, that opens the field to you, right? <laughs> if you come back and you're adding value and you're still enthusiastic, you got the right mindset, um, then you're probably standing out a little from the crowd. Right. Okay, so let's, let's get into strategies and let's talk about what are some good strategies for, for getting prospects to take action this year rather than wait till next year. Maybe I'll start with you, Janice. Yeah, I'm probably a little bit of the contrarian on this one. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I guess, you know, it, it kind of gets to what I was saying before. Um, you kind of have to plan early in 20 days. I mean, if you're selling a large complex, just, just because you should know, you should know in advance that the timeline aligns with your close date and that timeline should be reflective of when your prospective customer is going to see business value. And that all should be discussed up front. I talk a lot about, we, we talk about strategies. Um, I work a lot with either when I was managing a sales team and now when I'm in consulting, we do a joint evaluation plan or a sequence of events plan. You can call it anything that you want, but something where you are um, setting key activities that helps your cu prospective customer get to their business outcome in the time frame that they want and you assign responsibilities and timelines and that's reviewed from the very beginning of the sales cycle I mean things are going to change there may be um, uh, a solution that has to get implemented before yours does you want to know about that as far in advance as you possibly can and then of course in, in my world because we do sell large complex b2b sales you got to make sure your pipeline is filled in case something does slip or fall out mm -hmm. so my strategy is collaborate with your executives and collaborate often because things are going to change. Yeah, great. That's great. And what about you? Um, what about you, Chip? What? Uh, well, what I think it really depends on who's listening. What's your business model? Is it a complex B two B sale, or is it more of a transactional? You know, we've got people in the automobile business. You know, when's the best time to buy a car? Well, end of the month. When's the best time to do it? End of the year. December 31st is the best day because obviously they want to get the business in before the end of the year and that's a good time for you. So it kind of depends on somebody's business model if they're listening. I mean, you've got obviously a culture uh, built around people buying stuff, right? So we've got people in retail operations, you know, uh, to get people to buy now and move, you've got to create a buy, buying atmosphere. You've got to have fun. You've got to have energy. You've got to have the music. You've got to have the receptor. Re, re, um, what's am I trying to say? The uh, uh, reciprocation is a good way to build value. What are you giving people? The more you give to people, the more they feel inclined to give back. So um, I'm just, I'm glad to give you a question that we use really, really consistently. When I was with Anthony Robbins for those years and we were getting people to make a decision and it's a brilliant question you can use in many different sales scenarios. And let's say they were evaluating uh, back in the day when I started, we were selling very expensive seminars, for example, mm -hmm. right? And we would say, hey, James, not to say you were going to decide to go to that seminar now. And if you did decide to go for it now, why would you? 
It's just a brilliant question. Say, well, you know, I, I do it to help my family. Well, tell me more about that. What, what about your family is really important? Or I do it for my health. Well, tell me about your health. What's going on there? And then you just keep digging deeper and deeper and deeper. And by asking that question, I'll repeat it. Hey, not to say you would take action on this today or this month. And if you did, why would you? What's in it for you? What would it cost you not going? And just keep getting deeper and deeper and deeper. And you get people to help rationalize in their head. Um, they talk themselves into it. It's a very good question. Yeah, I, I like that. I think that's a, that's a great point. Because there's another thing that, uh, you know, this time of the year that you can help people with. And that is, it seems very tempting to push off an initiative to say, oh, I don't want to start something now. Let's push it off to January. But if you can also show that when you push off some does it at the beginning end of january is it february is it having impact later in the year than you think just because you say january doesn't mean it's going to impact the whole of 2019 um so there may be so that's a great question chip to ask that maybe gets them thinking about huh and maybe there are some good reasons for me to start now um spencer what's your thoughts on how you can get people to uh to take action now rather than wait to the new year. Yeah, you know, it's um, it's interesting because I think it's a lot of time as salespeople, we forget that the, the buyer or the customer, they're not on our timeline, mm -hmm. they're on their timeline. Um, and it's critical to get commitments up front prior to Thanksgiving and knowing where your decision maker or influencers, where are they gonna be in the holidays? You know, procurement, their job isn't to to purchasing their job isn't to get the sale done as quick as possible. It's the actually the opposite. They need to make sure they're getting the most cost effective solution. We want to get the sale done as quick as possible, but it's not about us. It's about it's about providing value. So it's understanding who those stakeholders are, where are they going to be, and you know, put our egos aside. Don't be afraid to pull out all the guns. And what I mean by that is is go to your sales manager, go to your sales leader, uh, go to go to a board member. You know. If someone can make a call on your behalf, that, that, that only helps. Another strategy that, I, that, that can help, you don't want to make a habit of that, but if we're trying to talk you know, year-end closed sales, you, know, you got to do what you got to do, obviously within, within uh, the rules and, and ethical. Um, the, the other idea that I was thinking about as a strategy is, and I mentioned this a little bit earlier, is, is getting in front of them with gifts. You know, yeah, a lot of salespeople will buy wine, will do things, but be creative. Buy lunch for, for their staff. Everyone likes to eat during the holidays. And look at me, I obviously like to eat <laughs> year round probably. But you know, I th one thing that I did, uh, I don't know, about 10, 10 or 12 years ago when I was um, a commercial real estate broker is I had uh, chocolate fortune cover cookies made. And inside of the fortune cookie, you could have a custom little message. And it, I think uh, in all, I spent about $200 on these um, and was able to hit, hit up about 30 clients, go door to door, drop them off. You wanna know how many people took my call when I followed up, John? But the, I would say the majority. A hundred percent. Absolutely. And what it, it did, I didn't, I didn't actually close any sales that month because commercial real estate, there's a longer sales cycle, sure. but I got a, excuse me, I got a ton of meetings set up. <laughs> I got a ton of meetings set up in, in January and February as a result. Shed load, I think is what you were looking for. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I thought those are, those are great ideas and kind of along the same, uh, along the same uh, kind of theme here. Um, and I'd be interested, maybe we start with Janice on this, your thought. Okay, so maybe if you look in your pipeline now and you have you know, prospects and you have the timeline, kind of, you know, early next year. Um, are there ways that you can go and look at those and, and make sure that those are next year and there's not the possibility of, of this year or, or even setting them up to close earlier next year? Because let's face it, one of the, one of the kind of traps that we always fall into is we work so hard to close the end of the year and then we have kind of crash and burn in January. Yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> Totally agree. Um, you know, whether you're trying to move something forward or whether you're just trying to escalate in either case, I still think, and I agree with, um, you know, everything that's been said, it's, it's all about value. So if you can convince the executives to, that by, by moving the timeline forward is gonna get them to their business outcome quicker with with minimizing the risk then then that that opens it to a different conversation because the different conversation could be the executive might say or executives might say yes we do want to get this done earlier 
But like I said before, it might be that they can't. Maybe right. they can't get the budget until a certain date. Maybe they don't have the resources, but at least you ask the right questions so that you understand it and then can kind of help them. Um, I think if when salespeople go into trying to uh, move a deal earlier or escalate something, as long as you're all about the value to the customer, I think the customer will be, be, be very open to the conversation and will provide you with maybe what some of the insights are. Uh, maybe they can do it and it makes perfect sense, or maybe there's reasons why they can't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and I think and, and I agree with that. And I think another good one is also that uh, you know when you're talking to them and saying you know I I really want to get this initiative underway for you, I want to make sure that we have all the resources lined up on our side. So you know the earlier I can lock in those resources to work on your project, the better. So just introducing you know some elements that they may think about. Eh, maybe there is it is worthwhile for me because I do think that one of the best ones, one of the best cons considerations for somebody is the fact that they they may have a timeline but they don't want that timeline to slip out the other way either right absolutely so, uh, so there's there may be an element there may be an opportunity there um, what do you think uh, what do you think Spencer about you know kind of helping or relooking at some of your you know early 2019 prospects and seeing if there is any any opportunity there to either move it into 2018 or to ensure that it happens relatively quickly in 2019 yeah i think that uh it is about timing and it is about value it, it's it, it's it's hard because we want to be persistent, but we don't want to be a pest, obviously. Um, and, and at the end of the day, uh, I think if you're asking yourself, you know, is this truly in the client's best interest to close in 2018? You got to put your commission aside. You got to put what's in it for you aside. And that's really hard to do in sales, right? We're in sales to make money and, 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 um, and live a good life, hopefully. Otherwise, there's plenty of other jobs out there that are not, that are not as hard as sales. So if you're asking yourself what's in the best interest for the client, um, I think you're going to come from an empathetic perspective and you're going to be able to influence them, not manipulate, influence them for what's in their best decision. And whether that's 2018 or 2019, if you're doing the right thing, the deal will, the deal will close at the right time. Yeah. And, and what do you think, Chip? <sighs> Can you be more specific just in terms of moving the timeline forward or? Um, yeah, in trying to move the timeline forward. So either kind of, you know, if you can move it into 2018 or if you can to ensure that it happens in, you know, relatively quickly in 2019. So because as we know, um, the first quarter can be an interesting one as well because initiatives that were on the table for January can suddenly get moved or something else can come in. So how do you kind of mitigate as best you can against this? Well, my business model is a little bit unique. I mean, I can't move the timeline forward sure. because, you know, what I do is I'm, I'm speaking of their convention and it's in January, February, December when it is. Um, what I would say just from past experience is with, with clients, uh, what is this problem you're solving? How can you show them from a, let's say, you know, sales 101, total cost of ownership, uh, putting out that money, how quick are they going to get the return on their investment? How can you show them by accelerating the decision now it's in their best interest to solve that problem or create more opportunities for them based on what that pro problem is and really making that very clear. I'm a big believer on um, using third party testimonials and documenting your success. So if you can go to your hopper of past sales and say, you know, here are five people just like you sitting in the same situation. We're so happy they jumped on this solution earlier. So it's not you saying it, but saying it and have some qualitative things in terms of how easy the implementation was, uh, how great you were to work with before, during, and after the sale, but maybe after the fact, once we implemented this XYZ cost savings or lead conversion, how can you show other people in a similar situation, just like them who took action quicker, it was to their benefit? Yeah, I think that's a fantastic, uh, a fantastic idea. And I think, yeah, if you have any any examples out there of people who actually said to you afterwards, wow, I'm so glad we moved quickly, or even, oh, I'm sorry we didn't do this sooner, I'm sorry that we spent so long in the evaluation stage or whatever. But that's-, well, that's I just that's think funny. salespeople in general, I'm not sure what mm -hmm. Janice and Spencer found. I, I just think they're very lazy. They're running to the next deal. They're not documenting their success. I mean, I get so much business. Somebody's in, you know, let's say 
uh, engineering company with, you know, I just got a booking today and I sent them immediately four other testimonials from people who I'd exceeded their expectations, just like them, similar situation. And it wasn't me saying how great it was. Hey, look at, this is what other people in your exact same situation, here's what their buying decision was based on and they chose me. So I, I think video testimonials are very powerful. Um, not just getting the testimonial right after, but two, three, four, five, six years later, going back to your best customers and helping to document that success. Most salespeople don't have those success stories to show. Yeah, you're absolutely right on that, Chip. I agree. Yes, yeah, Spencer. So do you want to talk a little bit about that? Because, I mean, Chip brought up a great point. I mean, where, you know, I know we're talking about accelerating end of your sales, but if you have some testimonials that show why moving quicker, faster is better for you, that's obviously a good thing, right? Absolutely. Uh, it's not only do salespeople not do a great job at building testimonials, case studies, uh, as well as asking for referrals. That's probably another topic, but yeah. um, <laughs> <laughs> that's, it kills me. But in regards to, and this, I think, question may come up a little bit later, um, you know, one thing that salespeople can do, but I caution them, and it depends on the industry and it depends on the product, but you can incentivize your, mm -hmm. your customer or your buyer to close in 2018, but you got to be really careful because it could be a slippery slope. One, you may potentially devaluing your product or service. You might then also be setting the benchmark or the bar for them moving forward if they're a repeat client. Um, but if it, if, it, if it helps them to close sooner and you take a little bit of a haircut on the fee or your company does, uh, you know, go ahead and do that. Um, but you also don't, uh, you want to be careful to not fall into be becoming a commodity game either. Yeah, so that's a good point. And maybe Janice, so you pick up on that. So we can obviously we want to close as much business as possible and we and you know most people are ready to incentivize uh, but you know when do we cross over in in overuse of incentives and and at, at what stage are these not really motivating for for buyers yeah i i love that question um if i think of the worst case if you will it's when we're training our customers that let's say at our year end, there's going to be a discount. Mm -hmm. And so you know, your company then ends up with this you know, hockey stick effect where all your deals are uh, uh, renewing or closing you know, in your December timeframe. Mm -hmm. And that could be very difficult. I know I've worked with a lot of, a lot of companies uh, in my consulting business where we see that and we work really diligently to try to stop training our customers there are going to be certain incentives. Totally agree that there are times where it's appropriate, um, but I think, again, it has to be kind of part of the plan. It can't be something that gets sprung at the last minute because then it devalues what you're selling. You don't want, you want them buying from you because they believe you're going to provide, help them, right, get to the value that they're trying to get to in the time frame with the least amount of risk. So my thing would be is, from an incentive standpoint, I can absolutely guarantee you that I have provided incentives to close deals mm -hmm. earlier, but be careful. And I kind of like the way Spencer said it. If you train your customers that way, I think that's a really bad idea. Yeah, exactly. So um, what, what do you think, Chip? Can um, incentives, can, uh, can they get overused? Can they actually, are they motivating, really motivating well, like, for buyers? Again, it depends on, on, on your business model. Mm -hmm. I mean, it can be, especially if it's more of a transactional thing and somebody's there, they're right in front of you. You know, what can you offer that's low cost, but high perceived value? You know, it could be as simple as free gift wrapping or free delivery, or we'll add this on. Maybe it's a, a training component or, or something you've already gotten the hopper that's done that you've already invested your money in that, mm -hmm. that you can give away for free, but in the customer's mind, gee, that's great value. Um, I agree hundred percent in terms of discounting and then especially for a, a rebuying opportunity then, Hey, I just bought it at that fee. Why is it this fee? And, and I hate like everybody else out there, the incentives, you know, uh, let's say you're a, a, a customer of the cable company and you've been paying X, Y, Z, and all of a sudden they're giving a better deal to brand new customers. It's like, what the hell? I've been with yeah. you for 10 years. You're giving them a better deal. You should give me the better deal. So you, you, you got to be careful from that mindset. But what are the low cost, high perceived value things you can give uh, as an incentive that people are going to you know, get some value from? Yeah, and I and I think that's a I think that's a really good point is the fact that we always think of incentives. Or we tend to think of incentives always in monetary terms, right? We always tend to think, 
uh, another few di another few percentage points discount or whatever but uh, you know we have a lot of other things that are of high value training is a good one if you think about it. i mean training mm -hmm. is 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 high value it's maybe something that uh, you know, you already have, or you you prepackaged, or it's something that you can do relatively easy, quickly. You can offer that. It also obviously has the added benefit of helping the helping your customer get the maximum return out of the product as well. So it's a kind of win-win for both sides. Um, so let me ask you another thing um, quickly, and this is this is is not so much accelerating sales at the end of the year, but but it is you know, helping set you up for the new year. And maybe Janice, we're going to start with this. What are some things that you think people could do better about qualifying and ensuring that they have the right timeline for, for their opportunities, that they're setting up the sales cycle in the best way possible, that they're really in tune with their customer? Is, are there in their prospect? Are there things that people still overlook that they could be doing now to make sure that Q1 is a good quarter? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I'd like to just kind of add something to the previous yeah. discussion because I was sure. thinking about it based on what Chip was saying. I think a great best practice and one that a lot of sales teams don't spend time on and they should is to come up with that list, right? Because mm -hmm. I agree with you. I think a lot of times we think it's a monetary incentive, but if you come up with a list of what are the type of things we can give that in essence don't cost that much, but are perceived as big value to the customer, I think just that exercise alone could be a great strategy. So I just wanted to kind of add to what Chip said. I thought that was excellent. And I'm going to ask you to answer, ask the question again. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. I was, I was busy listening to you. See, I'm active listening. I um, love that. <laughs> but anyway, just not, not to overdo that point, but I do think that is a good one for everyone to take away is that go make a list of things, kind of incentives that you could offer that don't, you know, put aside the monetary ones for the moment, the percentage points, look at all the other things that you could potentially offer. I mean, you could come up with something maybe that a customer and creative, maybe like Spencer mentioned earlier, that a customer goes, wow, hmm, never thought of that. That's a really nice uh, package. I want to take advantage of that. So back to the, uh, back to this question when I scramble my brain here uh, is what are some of the things looking forward into Q1? Okay, what are some of the things that salespeople can do while they're looking at their pipeline now to make sure that they have their opportunities as best qualified, as best set up as possible? Because there are still, I, I know from you know, statistics and from experience, there are still a lot of uh, drop off in pipelines in later stages, like way bigger percentages than, than there should be because of maybe less than rigorous qualification early in the process. So I, I've seen this a few different ways. Mm -hmm. I've seen it where the sales leader has said, um, my expectation is, is that um, we're going to have a meeting next month and I expect your pipeline to be 3x times what it is right now. Right. And then miraculously in a month, it's 3x times. <laughs> um, I would say that's probably not a best practice. Um, but I understand, you know, I understand that if the pipeline is not robust enough, mm -hmm. that, that sales leaders may go there. Um, my recommendation is, is just to kind of do the hard work. Get to know your buyers get to understand what it is they're trying to accomplish in a two to three year time frame. Again, I sell and, and manage and coach large B2B, mm -hmm. so it's a little different than transactional. And make sure that you understand the criticality and the timeline. And then, you know, I'm always about, you know, play the long game. You know, mm -hmm. don't build your pipeline just for one year. You know, try to build your pipeline that it reflects how your customers are buying in the time frames that they're buying. So a little mm -hmm. different than a transactional type, but I'd, I'd love to hear um, sure. you know, some other ideas from my... But I would say even even in, uh, it, probably more so in large complex sales, though you can't afford for uh, opportunity sales cycles to for it to go too far into a sales cycle if you don't have a realistic chance of winning it, right? Because well, there's no it's in bucks, but, <laughs> but what I'll add to that is stop, um, stop forecasting based on your sales activities Mm -hmm. and start forecasting based on what your, how your buyer is engaged at the different, yeah. at the different levels of, the stage, of your stages. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and maybe Chip, what, what do you think when you look forward and you're looking at, um, 
you know, opportunities in, in the future. How do you ensure that they're rigorously qualified? And what, what advice would you give to people? Because I do think qualification is still a bit of an issue for a lot of sales organizations. A lot of garbage gets way too far into the pipeline. Mm -hmm. Good question. Again, my business model, totally sure. different. When Janice was talking, I was just thinking, uh, you know, the good motivator, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. I think <laughs> you run the contest and it's Cadillac or it's steak knife. I think, you know, just give people, like she said, you know, you got to threefold your uh, pipeline. You got a month later, you're told to do it. And boom, you do it. So I have the contest. Uh, I, I think many salespeople don't have a great system, probably like pipeline or something like that, where you're have a way to keep people in the process. Um, one of the reasons I've been successful in my business is um, I, I'm very, very persistent. And until somebody says, go away, I'm gonna keep contacting them. So I've got people that I've been in the pipeline, sending a card here and there, send an email, send a new testimonial uh, every quarter for years. And then finally I get the business. So I think it's um, one, uh, there's a time to give up but if you've got somebody who is a great lead for you, stay persistent, stay in contact in an added value way, not just what's in it for you. How can you add some value? Um, I'm a big believer in uh, handwritten cards still. Um, I've been doing the, have you guys seen the uh, love pop cards? No. Like oh yeah, you showed, you showed me them last the time. Right there. Yeah, yeah. Like here's a new one with a black lab. Now look how cool that is. It's like a 3D black lab, you know? Um, doing things uh, in my business that gets people to go, wow, that's unique. Nobody's ever done that before. So I don't know if that answers your question, but from my standpoint, um, uh, again, my model is the events are when the events are. I can't move them forward. Sure. But I do have that pipeline of just staying in touch, staying in touch and adding value. So what do you think, Spencer? How can you make sure that uh, if you can't close stuff in 2018, that you've qualified things well for 2019 and that your pipeline is robust enough for that. What are some of the mistakes you can avoid so you don't end up at the end of Q1 scrambling like you are at the end of the year? Yeah, no, <clears throat> I really like this question. I think it, it really starts with taking a good look in the mirror. Um, and not falling back to old habits. And salespeople and, and sales leaders as well, you know, it's funny that Janet brought up the three X because that, that's, that happens so often in, in uh, B2B sales organizations, but it's really about quality. And at the end of the day, you need to look at your pipeline. And if you, the, we all have had plenty of prospects who've just, we've looked at them, we looked at them and we haven't really moved them very far. Move on, get rid of them find something else. And if you aren't able to qualify well, get training, find an outside coach called Chip, Janice, myself. Uh, there's, there's plenty of us out here who can, who can help salespeople understand what that qualification process is so that they have a quality pipeline. And sales managers, sales leaders, get your, get your head out of the clouds. You know, this is, this is a different era of selling. This isn't 10, 15, 20 years ago. The buyer is very savvy. They're very smart. And we have to sell on their timeline, not our timeline. So what does that mean? It means exactly knowing what their decision making process is, what that entails, how long does that take for them to do that? And then you have a pretty clear bucket, a pretty clear pipeline on what you will feel good about. You're not scrambling at the end of first quarter. The other thing that I'll, I'll touch on this is, you know, we, we, a lot of us have New Year's resolutions and a lot of people, and I'm guilty of this too, will have a New Year's resolution and it falls apart. Come up with a business plan, not a six, seven page marketing business plan, but mm -hmm. you, you don't want to just write down your goals that this is, you know, I want to make $200,000. I want to make $100,000. You have to know your why because that's how you avoid the peaks and valleys. If you know your why, if you know what, what, what values you have and you lose a deal, at the end of the day, that's gonna be okay. You're gonna have a bigger pipeline and you're not just gonna get a, get a deal closed or, or miss out on a deal and then check out for a little bit. Know your why and the question, I, I, Chip's question that he uh, gave earlier, the question that I will, will throw out and if you're a salesperson, if you're a sales leader, you need to write this down and you need to laminate it and you need to give it to all your people, give it to everyone on your team. And the question is this, what choice can I make and action can I take in this moment to create the greatest net value? Memorize this question, because if you can memorize this question, you'll allocate your time better, you'll qualify better, you'll provide more value, you'll make more money, and you'll be happier in life. Yeah, I, I love that, Spencer. I love that question. So, so next time, you know, you're tempted and you go, ooh, I think I'll check my Instagram. You should ask yourself, right. is that the highest... 
it's at the highest value activity I can do right now, especially if I'm behind on my quota. Um, there's a bunch of things there. I like that idea of putting a business plan together um, for, for next year. And, and just touching on something that uh, Chip mentioned and, and Janice be, mentioned earlier about focusing on what your buyer is doing. And I think that's a good thing, even as you look towards the end of the year. If your buyer isn't taking any action right now, there's probably very little you can do to close a piece of business you know in December if if the last time you had contact with them you haven't set up some some task for them to do to move the their their buying process forward well then you know it's probably not going to happen and you're right that's it's one of the core things that we did in 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 pipeline or CRM is set up that when you build a sales process that you can put in buyer actions and sales activities in each stage so you're not leaving it up to guesswork you're saying you should you your buyer should have done these things so your buyer should have confirmed there is a budget should have confirmed there is a timeline and this isn't guesswork on your behalf this is something that they actually said so later on you can come back and say if you come back and say well there's no budget and you go well hang on a second you said that the the prospect said there was budget and then you then that gets away from you going yeah well i kind of in you know kind of kind of they kind of intimated it and you go no that's not the point they either said it or they didn't so that's that's a great point so as we start to head towards the close of this um uh, what other advice would any of you have for maybe janice i'll ask you first any other advice for salespeople to both finish strongly this year and also set yourself up for a really good 2019. So to finish strongly, as I said, if you're if you're selling complex B2B, you should kind of know what you're going to close and don't be lazy. Continue to work on building pipeline. I mean, it doesn't stop. Um, work to understand, as I said, you know, play that long game, understand what these executives are trying to accomplish, understand why it's important to them now or into the future, understand their pipelines, start building a pipeline, a pipeline, excuse me, over time that sh starts to be reflective of your, what your customers are trying or your prospective customers are trying to achieve. I think if you do that, um, and, and, and you don't go with the, well, I think, but you, but you know, because you validated it with the customer, I think you have a quality pipeline, uh, one that will, um, will do you very well over time. And you don't have to start panicking 20 days in mm -hmm. because you'll feel very confident that you have either made your quota, you're in accelerators right now, or you kind of know where you are and you are hitting it hard for Q1. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's the, the that's the key the key word there is validation and validate. Always validate. Always Cause, validate. Because let's face it, we're fantastic at convincing ourselves we heard something that is favorable to us. <laughs> or or we're very good at in you know, intuiting that something, you know, the way they looked at me made me think they're definitely gonna buy, right? You always gotta validate. And um, um, how about you, uh, Chip? What advice would you have for people to finish strong and start strong next year? Well, I think if you want to finish strong and start strong, you got to be strong. Um, you know, key part of my message is you got to take care of your number one asset. How good a shape are you in? How often are you working out? What are you eating? What's your sleep habits? What are you listening to? What are you reading? So if you want to get better, I mean, my mentor, many people know Jim Rohn, R-O-H-N. If you don't know Jim Rohn, look him up on YouTube, passed away five years ago, was Tony's mentor. Jim said for things to get better, you got to get better. So one of the reasons some salespeople aren't doing well is they suck. They're not very good. They don't know their product. They're not trained. They're not working on themselves. So a um, couple tools I can give you to set yourself up for a great year next year. If you Google my name, Chip Eichelberger, Secret Goal Setting Strategy, there's about a three and a half minute video on YouTube to get really set up. Um, it's, it's like Spencer said, you've got to have your goals aligned, but you've got to have an action plan. So mm -hmm. part of the secret goal setting strategy is to determine what's really important to you. What do you want to accomplish per area? Where your standards are going to be? What are you going to hold yourself to? What's your compelling reason why you want to make that happen? Who do you have to be every day to live that? And I give you a format where you can actually print that thing out, laminate it, and put it in your shower. And what I challenge everybody to do is try it for a year. I mean, it sounds weird. Most people know they got to get that plan together, but what do they do? They throw it in a drawer. You need to look at that thing every single day and put your mind focusing on that consistently. 
Um, there's also, if you uh, Google get switched on energy schedule, that's an energy schedule. It's a goal setting sheet. Basically, you put on the mirror in your bathroom. It says, I will, I must work out how many days a month, and then you sign it. Then it's got six months right there, and you're filling in the days every month, and you're tracking yourself, you're tracking your weight, you're tracking your activity. And I've done that for 27 years. I got to tell you, it works. If you want to have a better sales year this year, you need to be better, better shaped physically, mentally sharp. What are you listening to? Are you listening to, I mean, obviously, if people are watching us right now and listening to this, mm -hmm. you're one of the very few. That says so much about you that you've taken action here today. What are you going to listen to on a daily basis? You know, mm -hmm. I, I just call it the 4% solution. 4% mm -hmm. of 24 hours, one hour a day. In your commute, what do you listen to? You listen to Howard Stern? Are you just wasting your time? Or you listen to the latest Tim Ferriss podcast? What are you going to do to get better? And if you take simple little steps, working out more consistently, listen to the right stuff, hanging around the wrong people. Some of you got people out there you got to disassociate from. I mean, they're mm -hmm. sapping your energy. You got to get those time suckers out of your life. But if you Google that secret goal setting strategy, follow that, test it for a year, put it up, see what the results are this year. I think you'll be thrilled. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with you, Chip. And we uh, was doing another uh, interview recently where we were talking about a lot of things like that. And also, as you say, what should you listen to? Like, if if it doesn't matter what side of the political spectrum you're on, um, you can find something every day that's going to annoy the whatever yeah. out of you, right? So don't. You know, the world the world keeps going. You don't need to know about every single thing that's going on, and the world doesn't affect you. Um, and same thing, social media. You can go onto social media, and you can suddenly go, oh, damn it, look, they just bought a Ferrari. They're doing really well. I, my life sucks. And suddenly <laughs> you're in it. And then it turns out later that it wasn't even their Ferrari they were posing in front of, whatever. Right. But so, so think about what you're doing. And I would say, before we get to Spencer, I would say, I, knew, I know New Year's resolutions suck, but... I would, I would advise everyone, one New Year's resolution is, as Chip was just saying, is invest in yourself, right? If you're a professional, invest in the thing that puts bread on your table, right? I, I have a neighbor, like he's retired now, so it's okay for him. He's out there every day practicing his golf swing, right? Fantastic. How many of you are practicing your golf swing rather than practicing your sales skills? And is your golf swing putting bread on your table? Probably not. That's why you're um, not a professional golfer. So <laughs> really invest time in, in your own professional development and don't wait for other people to do it. Mm -hmm. So um, Spencer, what, uh, what advice would you have for people to finish strongly and start strongly? Yeah, well, I, I love everything that's been said today and uh, I liked a lot what Chip said. Uh, but <clears throat> I can tell you this, you are one phone call away, one relationship away from a competitor getting in front of your client or your prospect. Someone like me, I will out dial you. And I'm not saying you as salespeople, but when you want, if you're gonna finish the year strong, the moment you wanna go leave early to do a little bit of extra shopping, you can buy everything online right now. So you don't need to leave early to go shopping in the first place, but don't be lazy. And a lot of this sounds simple. A lot of the stuff mm -hmm. that we're saying sounds simple, but simple isn't always easy. Yeah. Okay. And, and we have to, before we can lead, our clients or our prospects or customers into a buying decision, we have to be able to lead ourselves first. So I'm a certified cognitive self-leadership coach and everything that Chip said I loved about, about being healthy and about, you know, what are you reading? What are you eating? What are your sleep habits? Um, th that is critical. And, and it's, it's hard, you know, in the, in the sales industry, we're working hard, we might be on the road and traveling and, but you need, you need to take care of yourself. Um, when it comes to 2019, Absolutely, I'm a huge fan of putting an action plan together, a business plan, um, understanding what are my financial goals or what is the why, why am I actually doing this, why am I working at this company, what are my sales activity metrics, that uh, I, what are my inputs that I need to, to achieve, um, but hold yourself accountable. That, that part is key. Not only holding yourself accountable, so for example, if, if you don't hit your call goals for the week, are you going to come in on Saturday and pick up the phone? Mm -hmm. right? And if, if you if you do hit your call goals for the week or the month, how are you going to reward yourself? Are you going to take your wife, uh, partner, or spouse out, out to a, to a nice dinner? Are you going to go to a happy hour? Uh, so I'll I'll put myself on an example here. I um, I have some pretty uh, aggressive financial and health goals for myself, and uh, as a result, I um, I play football at University of Washington. I live a mile and a half from the stadium, and I've had season tickets for about twelve years. 
and I didn't go to one game this year. You know, that's like, John is like flogging myself. Okay. Mm. I love Husky football. I'm, I'm still hurting over that Cougar loss. I got to tell you, <laughs> oh my God, that snowstorm just killed him. Yeah. So the, but my wife and kids go, actually, I did go to one game because my friend was uh, highlighted uh, as a Husky legend, but I'm, I'm saying this because, you know, talk is cheap. You, you got to walk the walk. And so hold yourself accountable and take something away from yourself if you're not achieving those goals. Because I can tell you this, I am sure going to be in much better shape by this time next year. I know I will have more money because I don't want to miss any more, many more Husky games. So find out what is, what is important to you. Reward yourself or hold yourself accountable. Have a plan. And remember, there's a competitor who's out dialing you right now. Yeah. That's okay. anyway, you're investing yeah. in yourself right now. So yeah. you, you yeah. have a hall pass. The only way we could out dial uh, Spencer was actually get him on this uh, get him on this panel discussion. And while he's talking, I've been dialing all his prospects. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so um, just very quickly, maybe just a last quick word from each of you. Um, anything else you want to share about yourself, about how people can find out more about you, and maybe a tip for uh, for the new year, Janice? So Janice Mars, Sales Latitude. Uh, I'm Twitter, Janice Mars, Instagram, LinkedIn. I'm all over the place. Um, would love to connect to, to those that choose to. Uh, and I guess my advice would be, you know, we're in sales. We're in sales for a reason. It's hard, but have fun, right? Know that what you're doing is you're, you're doing it for a win-win. You're mm -hmm. trying to have your customers be, su be successful because you want to be successful. And so, you know, my advice is, Play the long game and have fun. Yeah, perfect. And Spencer, quickly. Yeah, sure. Uh, so uh, you can find me at uh, performnorth.com. The name of the company is Performance North. Uh, you can read more about uh, cognitive self-leadership. There's a link to take the assessment that I um, spoke about earlier. It doesn't cost anything. And in, in about 10 minutes, uh, you can complete that assessment. I'll be happy to get on a call with you and, and go over those results. But uh, reach out to me on LinkedIn. I'm at Spencer Morona on Twitter. Uh, and, and I like what Janice said, have fun. Uh, because you know what? Uh, there's always going to be another sale. There will always be another client. But uh, if you're not having fun, if you don't believe in your product or service, take some time to reflect on that and, and find, uh, find something that you do believe in selling because you'll be a lot more effective doing it that way. Yeah, great. And by the way, I can tell you, I've taken um, Spencer's assessment and he's gone through the results with me and it's all, it's, it's very interesting stuff. So again, as I, get, as I said earlier, I really, really advise people invest in yourself. And finally, Chip. Uh, thanks for being on the call. I enjoyed it. Chip Eichelberger, getswitchedon.com is my website. Uh, if you're a sales professional, you probably go to your sales convention and a lot of them are not great. So if you uh, know your meeting planner and you say, hey, I heard this guy, he might be a great speaker for our next sales convention, have him go to getswitchedon.com. Uh, I've got about 50 free videos on my YouTube channel. That's the nice thing about a unique name like Chip Eichelberger, all the social media platforms. I'm easy to find on Twitter or LinkedIn or whatever. But uh, go there and uh, check out those videos. They might help you everything from marriage to parenting to health to sales. Um, but I just encourage people, I, I like the piece about having fun. When I was on the road for Tony Robbins, um, the way I had fun is I hit my goals. And the way I had fun is I was accountable, like Spencer said. And I had key performance metrics that I made sure I hit. And if the activity was there, the sales results were there. So if you're not having fun, you probably don't know what your standards are and don't know where you're winning. So figure out where you need to win, hit those minimum numbers, and, and you'll have more fun because sales is more fun when you're selling. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, Sam. I mean, it, winning is enjoyable, and um, and if you're going to be in a, if you're going to be in a profession like this that requires a lot, then put the maximum effort in, and uh, you know, listen to the advice from all three of our panelists today. Um, go check them out. I tell you, they all have invaluable and, and unique things to offer. Uh, my name is John Golden. Uh, Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, Pipeline of CRM. This has been a fantastic discussion. We've covered a lot of ground. And so 20 days left, guys and gals out there. So go finish strong. Exactly. Nice one. Uh, nice one, Chip. <laughs> good segue. But, yeah, good segue. <laughs> but listen, my, m the last piece of advice is don't give up, right? Out, as, as you heard from here is outwork everybody else. There's going to be a lot of other people giving up. Who knows? You make that call on... 
December twenty eighth. Uh, that and the and you're the only person who calls that uh, that prospect, and that prospect has had time to reflect after after the holidays and is sitting there, maybe in a quiet office. Maybe you've caught them at just the right time for them to listen to you have a conversation, maybe make a decision, who knows? So thanks again to everybody and to see you all again for another panel discussion really soon.